Okay, let's go ahead and pray before we look at the word today. Lord, this is your word. These are your truths. These are the things you've decided to put in writing for us to understand. Lord, it is reckless for any of us to approach your word with our own <clears throat> understanding or our own um, I don't know, stubbornness or apathy. We just ask, Lord, that you would awaken us to your truth, that we would be people who delight after your law in the inner man. The Lord, we care more about what you say and your standards than what's comfortable or what's accepted in our culture. The Lord, we'd understand, Lord, that your word has been given to us as, as a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, so we don't stumble over things we don't need to. We pray, God, that we would look at your word with a great sense of reverence and respect, and we would order our steps according to your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. This week we're looking at the telling tongue. We're going to start in Proverbs 16, verse 27. Proverbs 16, verse 27. It says, An ungodly man digs up evil, and it is on his lips like a burning fire. Verse 28 of Proverbs 16 says, A perverse man sows strife, and a whisperer separates the best of friends. I just want to remind you that the book of Proverbs is a book that the Holy Spirit has given us that has much to do with day-to-day -day conduct. Um, there's not so much instruction about uh, the miraculous or even um, like spirit-filled, um, empowered action, but wisdom, which of course comes from the Holy Spirit, but it manifests itself in practical choices that display that we have the Creator as the one who's telling us how to live. Sometimes we always want the spectacular in our lives, but wisdom itself, coming from the one true wise God, shows a foolish world that there really is a way to live that God has ordered. And so uh, Proverbs is an excellent uh, book to stay in. A lot of the drama we have in our lives is often brought about just by making foolish choices. And God wants his people to have God's wisdom. So I want to remind you that when we're looking in the book of Proverbs, it has to do with really practical things in our lives. And I don't know about you, but sometimes things in my life that are a hassle aren't necessarily sinful things I've done, but foolish choices I've made. And here in Proverbs 16, it's saying that an ungodly man digs up evil. And we see that it's talking about an ungodly man. And some, some, some of ungodly means they're not like God. Or, or this isn't what God does, nor does God desire, nor does he want in his followers' lives. If we dig up evil on people and we love to have juicy information about a scenario, a situation, um, it means that we are being ungodly. This is a, even God himself, when he, we come to the Lord, we confess our sins, it says that he forgets our sins. Now, this doesn't mean that God really doesn't know what they are, but he chooses to not bring them up any longer. So if we are someone who likes to find out the dirt on people, uh, we like to be in the know, we are not being like God. And that word dig up means to plot or even literally like to dig up to try to find things beneath the surface. If we are someone who asks questions for information so that we have that on someone, we are ungodly. We are not to be that way. And we need to be a person who operates on a need-to-know basis. Do I really need to know the information about that problem in that person's life or not? See, we're talking about the telling tongue. We won't have a tongue that repeats evil about people if we don't have that much evil about someone. This is something we can do to prevent ourselves from being a gossip or a slanderer, is to make sure that we're not someone who digs up information on people. We'll be less tempted to operate in this sin if we don't know about the people. When we get information and we consider it fuel and we intend on spreading it, who can I tell? Who can know this? <clears throat> we're ungodly. I know the other night I was watching a uh, a documentary on the whole situation with uh, President Clinton and the Monica Lewinsky thing. And her friend um, that was calling Monica and recording the phone conversations to get information to give to a, a, a tabloid journalist. 
And you're, she was acting like a confidant, but she really was just getting juicy information to pass on. This is ungodly. This isn't how God works, you know, at all. The Bible says that our lips are like a burning fire. Remember in James chapter 3, verse 5, it says, See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, in verse 6 of James 3, a world of iniquity. We've learned that our mouth can bring destruction, just like one spark can happen and destroy an entire forest or house or neighborhood. We have to remember that our words can set a course on fire. If we are people who take a dainty morsel, mm, that was kind of delicious about them, and, and we want to go with it, we eavesdrop, we connect with sources, we are being ungodly. We are not being followers of the Lord Jesus Christ the way that God wants us to emulate His nature. When we have information, sometimes we hear something and we can feel like this burning, you know, it's inside of us. And it's like a temptation to want to let others know. Now, I know sometimes things are heavy. We get information and it weighs on us. I'm in the ministry. My husband's a pastor. I sometimes hear confessions or I know something's going on or a struggle. And sometimes it's a little tormenting, like at night to sleep or I'm going through something. But it's because it's weighty, but I should never want to pass that on to someone else. I might need more time in prayer. I might need to take that and really work through it in the presence of God or find someone who's uh, more mature in the Lord that doesn't know the person if I need counsel about it. But sometimes we can know something and, and there's a temptation to sound like you know we're in the know or we have something to talk about, especially women. We can be notorious for this. But in order to be the one who um, who tells who, we have to know if we are someone who's tempted to tell, we need to be someone who knows that we should avoid unnecessary information. This will take away the temptation to repeat a matter if we don't know the matter. Now, this is, this is what we do. Even before we're a gossiper, we need to be careful what we're hearing. Um, we shouldn't dig. If the less words that we speak, the less chance we have of sinning. We learn that. In the multitude of words, their lack is not sin. Proverbs uh, 16, 28 there says, a perverse man sows strife. Uh, perverse here doesn't mean like sexually perverse. The word perverse in the Bible means twisted, someone who's not operating in love and in clarity and is kind of a little bent in personality, ungodly, is someone who, who sows strife. And I like this because the word sow is a farming term, S-O-W. It means to plant seeds. Little things we can repeat. Oh, did you hear? Or did you know? Or you know what I heard? It's like taking a seed bag of information and we're planting these seeds. And it says this produces strife. It causes tension in relationships, in a church, in a ministry, in our household, in family, at work. We start, we can plant things that grow into division among people. And we're not supposed to be like that. We can end up causing strife, inflaming a situation, bringing about division, contributing to the enemy's agenda in our workplace, in our family, in our marriage. This is what happens if we do this. We can partner with the accuser of our brethren, passing on information like this. We can propagate lies. If we repeat something, we don't even know if it's true. We could be actually having a lying tongue without even knowing it. We can propagate accusations, shame. We can contribute to the destructive impact a sinful action has already uh, had. We can make it bigger just by repeating the matter to someone else. Proverbs 16.8, back to there, it says, A whisper separates the best of friends. Whisper here also is translated as a tale bearer, someone who repeats a story that they've heard. If we want to speak, um, for something, we want to be the one on it. We end up being that confident and bonding with someone. We align in a situation God doesn't want us to be in. And this is really natural for the world. Some people think this is just normal. This is how we talk. Hey, you know what I heard? Or, oh, so and so is getting divorced. Or, they're having a problem with pornography. Or, do you want to pray for this person? This is ungodly to go around repeating to people things that people don't need to know. It is ungodly. We can separate the best of friends, even if it wasn't our intention. 
when information burns on our tongues, it can seem kind of like a, a tasty dish we want to share. Mm, taste this. I did. I found it quite illuminating about this person. This is arrogance, and we shouldn't be like this. They poison and they will wound. Proverbs 18.6 says, A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calls for blows. Verse 7, A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. A snare, it's like a trap you put for an animal. Our soul is our inner man. If we speak foolishly and we do these things, we end up tormented inside, trapped in situations. You've ever done that? You're like, why did I say that? Oh, I got in that situation. Verse 8 of that same chapter says, The words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles, and they go down to the inmost body. In the English Standard Version, it's written, The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the innermost parts of the body. I mean, we even use that word like, oh, you got juicy gossip? Because we can taste it. A fool's mouth doesn't mind stirring the pot. And really, a fool <clears throat> needs the slap of the Lord across their face. It is destructive. We are partnering with the destroyer. The lips will snare our souls, will trap us in situations that set us up for attack. When you trap a bird, what is it for? To go and kill the bird and eat the bird. If someone traps an animal, it's for food. So we end up trapped and the enemy comes and just devours us, our relationships, our witness, our peace. We really need to be careful about repeating stories and telling people what we know. It can smolder and give us a sour inner state, even kind of an inner nausea. You know, we tell somebody something and they just kind of listen, but they walk away and we don't know what it did to them, how it poisoned them about somebody. We have to be careful about what we say. We have to have one of those things like where we say, is this a need to know? Do I, does this person need to know? I used to work for Northrop and we worked on the B-2 bomber. And it was a classified project. So everybody had a different level of clearance, including documents. They, there would be documents, and you had to have a certain clearance to see certain documents. Even our badges. My father worked there as well. He had a red badge. I worked there. I had a green badge. And even if the information didn't seem like it was important, you still had to have a need to know. My badge was only getting me into certain areas. My clearance was only allow me to see certain documents. And really, in the spiritual warfare we are in, we need to be careful whether someone really needs to know certain information or not. Do they have a clearance for it? Proverbs 17.9 says, He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. Here it is again. If I know sin or dirt on someone, I'm supposed to cover that. That's seeking love, not telling somebody something they don't need to know. We don't want to expose people unnecessarily. When people sin, they don't need a bunch of people analyzing them or praying for them when really it's just a guise for saying, I know dirt on someone. You know, I think you get... Well, and not everybody, but you should get better at this as you get older. After you've caused problems between people and you go, okay, I need to not be so quick to expose information. Some people stay in this and they even thrive off of this. Some of the reality shows love this kind of baiting with one another. But the Lord doesn't want this with his people. We must not be the one who unnecessarily lets people uh, into information they do not need to know will separate friends or will even trouble them. Have you ever heard something you wish you hadn't have heard? You're like, why did they tell me that? I didn't need to know that. And you end up, they go into the innermost parts of your belly. And you're like, oh, I didn't need to know that. It contaminated my whole mind about them. Proverbs 26, 20 says, where no wood is, there the fire goes out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceases. Do you want to have a better marriage, better friendships? Don't tell each other everything you know about other people. I'm married. And there's things that I hear my husband doesn't need to know. 
This thing's my husband hears. I don't need to know. All it does is you end up in gossip sessions in your marriage, talking about other people rather than encouraging one another, enjoying life together, proclaiming what God is doing, laughing together. You end up biting and devouring other people in your relationships and it can destroy it. It says there that where there is no wood, the fire will go out. And so when you stop repeating things, then you can calm down a situation that might have been inflammatory. We can help keep damage from going further than it needs to go. Strife will cease if we stop repeating the information. I've been in spiritual warfare where I've been very overwhelmed by what's been going on. And you kind of want to tell everybody to get them on your side. But I realized the more I repeated even lies about me, the more I repeated the lies, the more I made the situation bigger with more people involved than it needed, than needed to be. So be careful about repeating matters. We're going to look at uh, what happened when a person got some information and repeated it, and it should warn us in the scriptures. We're going to be uh, starting in 1 Samuel 21. Let me give you a little background. David had fled from Saul. Uh, David found out that Saul wanted to kill him. Saul was a king, and David was supposed to take the throne after King Saul. Saul was threatened by this. So in Saul's mind, he had a plot to kill David so he could retain the throne. Well, David found out. David even lived in the palace. He found out that Saul wanted to kill him. So what David did was he fled from the palace and he went out into the wilderness. And all of a sudden, his whole life changed. He left his family, his wife, his friends, his home. And now he was running uh, like a fugitive knowing that Saul and his army could come after him at any moment. He was scared. He was overwhelmed. He, he, his whole life changed in one moment. He just had the clothes on his back, and he fled out to a place called Nob. And there, there was a priest that ministered in this city called Nob. And David was hungry because he just left suddenly. So he went to the priest, and he asked for something to eat. So we're starting in 1 Samuel 21, 7. It says, now, while he was there, there was a certain man of the servants of Saul there that day. He was detained before the Lord. And this man's name was Doeg. He was an Edomite. He was from the city of Edom. He was the chief of all the herdsmen that belonged to Saul. So now you've got David at this place with his priest, and there's a servant of Saul. The one who's going to kill him, the one who's looking for him. Now, David, uh, obviously, he was very upset. He was there. He was disoriented. He didn't know what was going on. And he was in a place where he didn't even discern that Doeg was a, aligned with Saul. And he was in a place where you know, he's nervous. He's asking for bread. And Doeg's over there just listening and watching the situation. I want to remind you, be careful about your mouth and who is around when you're saying something. There are eavesdroppers. There are people who want information. If you're at work or you're in a place at a church talking, we're allowed to stop talking if we feel we're within the ear reach of someone that shouldn't have the information. I've been in situations talking to someone, someone joins our conversation, and I just change the subject. Or I tell the person, I'm not going to continue with this conversation, conversation at this time. We'll pick it up a little bit. So wait, what's going on? We, we don't have to keep going with information if you don't know the person that's there or they shouldn't really have the information that you're giving. We may not realize there's a tail bearer in our midst. <clears throat> so in verse 8, David said to this priest, and the priest's name was Ahimelech. So we got Doeg over here. We've got Ahimelech over here. We've got David over here. And David's scared, running from Saul. And David said to Ahimelech, Is there not here on hand a spear or a sword? Because he wasn't armed to protect himself. He says, I brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because mm, the king's business required haste. Well, David's lying. David's totally in the flesh, actually. This whole story is about here's a man after God's own heart, but because of his fear and how things change quickly, he resorts to lying. He wasn't trusting in the Lord. 
And this could happen to the best of us in the moment of, of fear. We don't have to do that, but we do see even a man that God says, you know, is after his heart had a moment and a lapse of trust. And he was lying because he wasn't there for the king's business. Verse 9. So the priest told him, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, there it is, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is no other except that one here. And David said, there's none like it. Give it to me. Now, a little side note that isn't about tail bearing and gossip and repeating a matter. David asks for a spear and a sword. He didn't have any weapons. Um, and he, he's, he asks for it. And what's very interesting is he says, if you look at Ahimelech says in this verse, it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. A lot of you are going, it's really neat, Maureen. Who cares where it is? Well, because it means something. I don't know if you know this, but the ephod was what the priest used and put on to seek God and his will, especially when there was a battle or somebody coming against you. The priest would put this on and say, Lord, what do I do in response to the enemy coming at me? It was a sign of prayer, dependency, trust, and looking to the Lord. David was looking to the sword and the spear, not the Lord. And we know that the Lord is mightier than the sword and the spear. And what's interesting <clears throat> is that David had to go past the ephod to get that sword, or Ahimelech had to walk over the ephod to give it to David. They really walked past what was the most powerful weapon in this place of vulnerability, which was to humble themselves before the living God and say, what do we do in this situation? But Ahimelech didn't know that David was being pursued by Saul. He didn't tell him that. He lied to the priest, and he said he was there on the king's business. So Ahimelech, you know, with a good heart, kind of gave him that sword and thought, oh, it's for the king, and oh, here, take the sword. He was pulling Ahimelech into his lie. I wonder what would happen if David took him aside and said, listen, Saul's out to kill me. What should we do? I bet you him like would have put on the ephod, they would have sought the Lord, and there would have been a much better ending than what we're going to see. So even be careful when people talk to you. They're not always telling you the truth. So Doag is in this area. And what does he hear? Weapons, swords, spears. And he noticed, huh, David now has a Goliath sword, which, by the way, weighed between 20 to 50 pounds. So verse 10, David arose and fled that day from before Saul and went to Ashish, the king of Gath. So he goes back, uh, Doag, uh, David arose and fled that day, and Doag goes back to Saul. He's done. And in 1 Samuel 22, 7, after Doag goes back, and you saw David, and by the way, Doag didn't know that David was fleeing Saul. They didn't have cell phones. He didn't know. He's over there in Nob. He watches David. He probably even thinks, oh, he's probably there for the the king's business, he probably thought nothing of it, but he stored away the information. First Samuel 22, 7, later, Saul said to all of his servants, Doeg comes back, and he says, Here now, you Benjamites, um, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? What he's saying is Saul called everybody together. And he said, Look, this guy David, he can't give you what I can give you. I'm the king. It's my kingdom. And he called them to kind of question their loyalty and let them know that David has left and has run and don't get on his team. Verse 8 of 1 Samuel 22 says, All of you have conspired against me. There's no one who reveals to me that my son has made a covenant with the son of Jesse. There's not one of you who is sorry for me or reveals to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as it is this day. Well, okay, Saul's whining. He's exaggerating. It's just that Saul's son, Jonathan, warned David that Saul was going to kill him. So Saul's a little ticked at that. But he didn't, you know, he wasn't conspiring to come again. He was just saving Saul, uh, David's life. David didn't do anything to Saul. Jonathan was a real righteous guy. And he loved his father. He didn't leave with David. He stayed loyal to his father, but he protected David at the same time. That's a whole friendship study. So then 1 Samuel 22, 9, it says, Then answered Doeg the Edomite, who was set over the servants of Saul. He said, Hey, I saw the son of Jesse. That's David, the son of Jesse. 
going to Nob to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. And verse 10, he inquired of the Lord for him. He gave him provisions. He gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. We never read Ahimelech inquiring of the Lord. I think Doeg just assumed that happened. I'm not sure. But he does repeat what he saw, what he heard. He tells about the sword of Goliath. And in 1 Samuel, um, remember, and it might have stirred up Saul's insecurities. Because if you remember, Saul first started hating David when David killed the Philistine, the Goliath, and all the women were singing a song about him. That's when the whole problem started. So then he says, yeah, he took the sword of Goliath. Trigger word, you repeat something, you never know what it does in someone else's heart. Back in 1 Samuel 18, 7, it says that after Goliath was killed, <clears throat> the women sang as they danced. And they said, Saul is slain his thousands. And Saul was probably like, yeah, they're singing about me. But then it goes, and David, his ten thousands, ooh, numbers, comparison, women, all that with men. That's a problem, isn't it? And it says in verse 8 of 1 Samuel 18, that Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, hmm, they have ascribed to David ten thousands. Hmm, to me, they've ascribed only thousands. Now, what more can he have but the kingdom? It says, so Saul eyed David from that day forward. So then Saul hears about Ahimelech from Doeg. He's getting kind of perturbed about the whole thing. And he sends for Ahimelech, the priest. First Samuel twenty-two thirteen. 13. Now remember, Ahimelech knows nothing about Saul trying to kill David, David fleeing. He thought David was there on the king's business. First Samuel twenty-two thirteen. 13. Saul said to him, why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse? And that you've given him bread and a sword. You've inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to, to lie in wait as it is this day. But in verse 14, Ahimelech answered the king and said, Hey, 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 who among all your servants is as faithful as David? He's, he's on your side. What do you mean conspire with him? He's, he's your son-in-law. He goes at your bidding. He came to my house because you told him to come. See, David lied about that, didn't he? And he's honorable in your house. Verse 15. Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Far be it from me. Remember he didn't. He had to step over the ephod. That never happens. The whole thing is confusing. When you start repeating things, we get things wrong. We exaggerate things. We minimize things. Somebody tells us may not even be an accurate assessment. Ugh, try not to repeat things if you don't have to. He says, let not the king impute anything to his servant or to any in the house of my father. Your servant knew nothing of all this, little or much. This is the truth. In verse 16, and the king said, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. All because David lied and Doeg repeated it. Verse 17, then the king said to the guards who stood about him, turn and kill the priests of the Lord because their hand was with David and because they knew when he fled and did not tell it to me. But they didn't. They didn't know that. But Doeg kind of said, yeah, and he has the sword of Goliath. And see, he created this scenario before the priest even came that, remember, it says it separates the chiefest of friends. It, we, 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 we stir up strife when we repeat, hey, I saw this. Someone was here. I saw them by the bar. <laughs> you start repeating things. You don't even know what could happen. And, and the king's servants were like, this is what they said. The servants of the king would not lift their hands to strike the priests of the Lord. They're like, mm-mm. So then the king said to Doeg, you turn and kill the priests. So you know what happened? Doeg, the Edomite, he turned. This is so sad. And he struck the priests, and he killed on that day 85 men who wore a linen ephod. They weren't warriors. They were no threat. They were priests of the Lord. Verse 19, and also Nob, the city of the priests, he struck with the edge of the sword. Oh, get this. Both men and women, children and nursing infants. He killed nursing infants. He had killed them a lot with his tongue. Remember, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And um, 
a little follow-up real quickly at the end of this is uh, later Saul had to come and um, the son of Ahimelech actually came to David and said, my dad's killed and all these priests are killed, which is really sad because I think David realized his lie got a lot of people injured. And you guys, lies, that's a whole other study we covered. We really injure people when we lie. And, and Ahimelech's son came to David and told him what happened. Look, in 1 Samuel 23, 6, Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David at Keilah. And he went down, and it was so precious, he brought the ephod in his hand. And Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah, and Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand. He shut himself in by entering a town that's gates and bars. Saul called all the people together for war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And David had the ephod from Ahimelech's son after he heard that Ahimelech was murdered because he lied. And David knew that Saul plotted evil against him. And you know what he said to Abiathar, the son, who was a priest also? He said, bring the ephod here. He didn't ask for the sword. He didn't use his sword. He knew that he had to seek God and not the sword. And by the way, we never read David using the sword of Goliath. So he just carried around a bunch of dead weight because he thought this would protect him when really it was the Lord that was to protect him. And he wasn't to depend upon a sword or trust in the sword or shield, but remember the name of the Lord, his God. Lord, we thank you for this message, Lord. We thank you for showing us in um, just the recklessness of David to lie when he shouldn't have or say things in front of people that he shouldn't have, or Doeg repeating a matter, and all, even innocent nursing babies were killed from that. Lord, help us not to be people who eavesdrop, or are reckless with information, or repeat matters to other people. Help, Lord, us to know how to not be part of causing strife, or separating the chiefest of friends. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.